right guys I'm gonna start straight away I know some of you join later or watch this video uh, later on Canisius Deep welcome the Kangana Gunyora I forgot to write the title of this talk but most of you will know that uh, when I come on it's all about the Bitcoin so I wanted to explain a little bit more uh, because I know a lot of you just seem to have this idea that Bitcoin is about cash or about money and that you can make some money out of Bitcoin and some of my friends are saying you should have made a lot of money by now and I just tell them look for me Bitcoin is not about uh, making instant cash or instant riches I think if that is your idea of what Bitcoin is all about, then you will find that you'll probably fall prey to those people uh, that are promising a lot of money. And then they give you some details, you give them your money. And at the end of the day, you're probably likely to lose, especially if what the person is using is called a or it's a platform which uh, is centralized in which case that platform can lose money or can be hacked or something like that so let's talk about bitcoin and what it is first of all it's a disruptive technology if you think that the internet was disruptive if you think that the internal combustion engine was disruptive or if you think that electricity the invention of electricity was disruptive if you think that the invention of the car engine the internal combustion engine if you think that was disruptive then you need to think about bitcoin as being the next disruptive technology after all of these technologies that have changed the course of human life these technologies have changed the course of human life and Bitcoin is doing exactly what those uh, technologies have done. Because first of all, Bitcoin is a technology. Bitcoin is not just the money that you've heard of, but it's, it's a technology uh, and money is just the first, uh, it's just the first application or the most prominent one of those technologies because we already have applications which are more than the bitcoin the money so we've got more than just bitcoin the money we've got other applications right so let's talk about bitcoin and i have here the bitcoin white paper and the bitcoin white paper is simply what um, Satoshi Nakamoto had in mind when he thought about Bitcoin. So let's look, I'm just going to look at the abstract of the white paper, then I'll look at the introduction. I will also look at the network uh, section of it where it talks about the network. And then I'll look at the part where it talks about incentive. Then I'll also look at the part where he talks about privacy, a little bit on privacy, not trying to be technical. Uh, some of, part of the paper is quite technical. Then I'll go to the conclusion. So to begin with, and if anyone wants to be added, they can come on. And I'm going through this, it's gonna take about half an hour without interruptions. But if anyone wants to join at any time, let me know and I'll let you join. And then you can ask any questions. If I can answer them, I'll answer them straight away. If not, I'll probably do a bit of research and then I'll come back to you. 
So the abstract starts as follows. So, I mean, the, first of all, the title is Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Now, it's important to understand peer-to-peer, -peer, which basically means from person to person. Electronic cash system means a system of electronic cash. Now, what does that mean exactly? So what that means is we have, for the first time, a system of electronic cash. By cash, what do we mean? Um, imagine that you've got $10 or £10 in your pocket. You could simply uh, pay for goods using that money, and that's physical cash. We have not been able to make the equivalent of cash payments in the digital form. So in the digital form, it's not cash because I cannot pay you. It's not peer-to-peer -peer cash because I cannot pay you digitally, directly, without going through a third party. So going through a third party or going through a bank introduces some kind of friction. It slows down the process because the bank can decide that they can hold your money for a certain period of time before it's available. In fact, whenever you send a transaction to somebody else um, through a bank to their bank, they might tell you that it will take it might take up to 48 hours or it might take up to whatever time the bank says for that money to go through. What that means is it's not cash as in I cannot use my digital money okay, in my bank to pay for, say, tomatoes or for goods. So basically what it means is in the digital world, We've not had a situation where you can pay for goods directly with digital cash directly from one person to the other person. Whenever you use your card, whenever you pay using digital currency, you're paying the other person through a third party. So you're paying through a bank or a financial institution. Okay, which means this is not, it does not mimic cash. So what does um, Bitcoin do? Bitcoin comes and Bitcoin is able to allow you to make a direct payment to the person next to you or to anybody around the world without going through a third party, without going through a bank. Okay, so that's peer to peer because you're not going through a bank. It's not from peer to business to peer. It's peer to peer. So you're bypassing the third party you're bypassing the third party and the third party will charge you for a transaction but because it's going peer-to-peer -peer, you're not being charged so what's the difference between electronic cash and just cash or just electronic cash in in the form of bitcoin or just electronic cash the difference is electronic cash as bitcoin is peer-to-peer -peer. electronic cash in the traditional sense is not peer to peer, but is peer to business, then to peer. Or is peer to business, then to another business, then to peer. Because sometimes it's peer to business, then from business to the government, where this money is going, then from the government to peer. So sometimes it takes, which is why it's expensive to send money. But with Bitcoin, it's cheap because you're sending from person to person. So no third party is involved. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. So let's look at the abstract. The abstract, guys, if there are questions, please ask because I want to answer questions as we go along. So the abstract reads as follows. A purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. So it's exactly what I've been explaining. So it means with Bitcoin, you bypass a financial institution and money is going from person to person or from peer to peer. Okay. And it's electronic cash. As in, it's as if you're paying somebody cash. So imagine you've got 10 pounds in your pocket 
and you buy some tomatoes, um, you can pay for that using the 10 pounds and you can get your change straight away. So it's the same thing now with uh, Bitcoin as cash, as electronic cash, and that you are able to do a similar transaction, but you're paying the person directly because the, the money is not going through a financial institution first or through a bank. So it's coming straight to the person. Okay. Digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double spending. So double spending is a problem which Bitcoin is trying to solve. It's a problem which is not a problem uh, when you're dealing with uh, physical cash, okay? If you have 10 pounds, I'll keep using 10, if you have 10 pounds in your pocket, and you spend five pounds, you're left with five pounds, okay? That is if it's cash, but if it's not cash, if it's electronic cash, okay, for uh, electronic money, it means that if you pay for goods for, if you have 10 pounds and you pay for goods for five pounds, the third party, which is the bank, uh, the bank which is handling the transaction, may not immediately reconcile that you now have a balance of five pounds. So it might still reflect that you still have 10 pounds and you could spend uh, the other five pounds and be left with nothing. But the bank could still say you have 10 pounds in your account. So you could still spend another 10 pounds. So eventually with the 10 pounds that you originally had, you could spend 20 pounds, okay? And that means you have done what we call double spending. But you can't do double spending if you have 10 pounds cash, because as soon as you get five pounds change, your pocket reflects that you've got five pounds in your pocket, physical cash, okay? Then if you use the five pounds as remaining, then you're left with nothing. But if you're using your card, it, will, it could reflect that you still have 10 pounds. So you could spend another 10 pounds on top of that. And that's what we call double spending. So double spending is um, not possible when you're dealing with Bitcoin. We propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof-of-work forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof-of-work. Okay, so there is proof-of-work, which means that the system is able to recognize that um, a certain amount, um, amount of money has been spent at this time because it's timestamped. Okay, it's like uh, it knows that at five past 12, you spend five pounds and at seven past, you spend the other five pounds. So uh, you cannot double spend because it is reconciling those um, transactions as soon as they happen. Okay, then I don't think I'll go through all of this because um, already it's sounding very technical and I didn't want it to sound technical. Um, so we've, I've, I've read about the proposition for a solution to the double spending problem. Then the network timestamps transactions by hashing them, I've read that. The longest chain not only serves as proof of the sequence of events witnessed, but proof that it came from the longest, largest pool of CPU power. So what does this mean? It means that these guys are using, um, they are using proof of work. For example, if you look at Great Zimbabwe in Zimbabwe, okay, if you look at the pyramids of Egypt, if you look at the buildings in London, or if you look at any kind of infrastructure, if you look at the Mona Lisa of painting, for example, that is proof of work. Okay, it means somebody put some work into it. It's proof because it's, it's physical evidence that some work was done. Okay, it's physical evidence that some work was done. Now, 
in Bitcoin, it's, um, the system tries to mimic uh, that kind of proof of work, okay? And it also timestamps it so that we know, and it timestamps it and then it forms a chain of evidence. So the chain is evidence and the longest chain is evidence that CPU power was used because uh, these transactions use a lot of electricity. They use CPU power, they use electricity. So the longest chain is proof that the largest amount of CPU power has been used to obtain the longest chain. Just like the tallest building is proof that more energy has been or more time has been spent building the largest building than building a smaller building, okay? Although the reverse could be just as valid because technology might have ass uh, assisted uh, to make um, the tallest building take the shortest amount of time, okay? But in terms of Bitcoin, the longest chain, because each part of the chain is being, is using a lot of electricity, and that electricity that is being used is proof that work has been done. Okay, so the longest chain is proof that work has been done. So that's why they call it proof of work. Okay. As long as majority of CPU power is controlled by nodes and are not com uh, cooperating to attack the network, they will generate the largest, the longest chain and outpace attackers. The network itself requires minimal structure. Messages are broadcast on a best effort basis and nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the largest, the longest proof of work chain as proof of what happened while they were gone. Okay. So there's um, a lot to take in here. Then this got an introduction uh, on the white paper. I'm going through the Bitcoin white paper. Uh, the very first paper, okay, uh, before the introduction of the actual Bitcoin currency. And by the way, this Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system is so revolutionary that it describes exactly how Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency, and all the applications which uh, build on top of the Bitcoin protocol or Bitcoin technology uh, operates. So it's not just about the money, like I've said uh, at the beginning of this uh, live broadcast, but it's also about the other applications which use the Bitcoin protocol. And the protocol is just a system of rules, okay? So let me see. I don't want to make this long, but uh, there's an introduction which says that commerce on the internet has come to rely almost exclusively on financial institutions serving as trusted third parties to process electronic payments. While the system works well enough uh, for most transactions, it still suffers from inherent weaknesses of the trust-based model, completely uh, non-renewable transactions are not readily uh, possible. Okay, so I think you can download this um, white paper and read it for yourself. I'd recommend that you read the abstract and then you just read the introduction and then you read in the, about the network and then you can read about the incentive. Uh, so instead of uh, continuing to read this, I'll just talk about them as I've already read this before. So in the introduction, they talk about um, the fact that the internet is an e-commerce or a commerce uh, platform. Uh, uh, and on this platform, this is what's been happening. Third parties have remained third parties. Right, Felix, I'll answer you very quickly on that one. So the story here is that I'm talking about Bitcoin, uh, but I don't want to focus on Bitcoin 
um, the fluctuating cryptocurrency that you've seen in the papers, that you've seen on the internet, uh, where in December it went up to almost £20,000 per one Bitcoin. And now it's almost, uh, I think it's gone down to less than 5000 So it's been fluctuating quite uh, a lot. But the white paper is not just about uh, Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency. The white paper is about Bitcoin, the protocol itself. So it talks about what other applications could come up. For example, earlier this week, I talked about an application called Apex, which is going to come up later this year. And Apex, A-P-P-I-C-S, Apex is like Facebook. So it's a social network which is coming up. And that social network is going to uh, mimic Facebook. But the only difference is that it's going to pay people or it's going to reward people um, for posting, for commenting, for liking posts, for watching. So if you're watching this uh, on Apex, you're going to be paid for it. That's what basically what it means. And that comment that you put there, if you uh, put a comment on Apex, you'll get paid for it. And so it rewards the attention that you're getting on social media. So the application Apex, okay, which is coming out later this year, bases it's the way that it works on this very white paper. So this white paper is not just for Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency, but it's also for Bitcoin, um, the applications. So, and Apex is one of them. Right now, there's an, a, a platform called Steemit, which is like... Um, it's a blogging platform just like WordPress. And on this platform, if you post on it, if you get comments, if you get likes, if you get reposts and stuff like that, you get paid for it. Okay? So this is the fundamental document or white paper behind all these applications which are going to come up. You also have DTube, which is like a YouTube. Okay? It's a video blogging platform. Uh, for those for people who want to do vlogging but now on facebook on 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 youtube if you if you have less than 1000 um followers or 1000 subscribers you cannot monetize your content if you could monetize your content before uh, after the 1st of April or something like after the 20 something of March, it means you can no longer do that. You need to get at least a thousand view, uh, view, uh, subscribers. And besides the 1000 subscribers, you also need, uh, more than 4,000 hours of, of viewing on your site so that you're able to monetize your content. But on YouTube, you don't from day one. From the first video, from the first view, from the first comment, from the first like, from the first share, from the first response to a comment, you're already attracting some kind of revenue from it. Uh, the founder of Apex is not somebody you would know. It's a group of uh, people, I think they are from Switzerland or something like that, who have come up with Apex. Um, but I can always, uh, I can always look that up. Jason, how are you? So I can always look that up and I can put it in the comments, uh, afterwards, or I can look it up here. Uh, I've actually got one of the, one of their papers here, which I'm going to do one of these days. Let me just search for it. And I can tell you who is. There's quite a number of people. Uh, if you go on my Facebook, you will find. I'll probably post it about these guys. Okay, but uh, I mean, we can always. I can always find that out, and and I'll respond to that comment later on. Okay, so. So there are many applications which are coming up, which are going to use. 
uh, the decentralized, because the, the issue here is about the difference between a centralized uh, network and a decentralized network. So a centralized network is like Facebook because for you to, when you post something on Facebook, okay, it goes to a central location um, at a, a data center which Facebook is maintaining. And if Facebook is down, it means nobody can access Facebook. Uh, but if it's decentralized, it means that you would have a copy of Facebook on your machine at home, and I would have a copy of Facebook on my machine at home, and every user of Facebook would have the exact same copy of Facebook on their machines. So that if my machine was down, okay, um, Facebook would carry on on all the other machines. But if Facebook is on some farm in California, it means that if that farm, if that, if that place is attacked, then there is no Facebook. If that place is down, then there's no Facebook. So those are centralized systems, just like a bank. A bank is a centralized system. If the bank is closed, okay, you cannot access banking services, which you can use when a bank is open. Uh, you could probably use their online banking system. But if the online banking system was also down, because we know that sometimes banks will do uh, maintenance sometimes, and they'll tell you that from midnight on a certain day to five in the morning, uh, there will be no services. Okay, so they can do that, which means at that time, for those three or four or five hours, you have no access to Facebook, I mean, to, to, to your bank even, the online version of the bank, okay? You might still have access to the ATM, but that means you have to go out and withdraw your monies, okay? So that's, um, so the main difference here is that these platforms which are coming up, which are based on the blockchain, those platforms are decentralized, whereas what we have now are centralized systems, just like government is a centralized system, okay? Which is why some people fight for devolution because they want devolution because they want to make their own decisions because the decisions which are being made on their behalf are not in their best interests or they are not being made uh, timelessly. So they would like to be in charge of their own decision making. Okay, So the difference, the major difference between, for example, Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency and a digital currency which is just a digital version of the fiat currency is that the digital um, is that the is that the bitcoin is decentralized and um, the digital form of fiat currency is centralized which means barclays is in charge of the database uh, where all the transactions are happening so they can decide uh, when to open, when to close, and stuff like that. Okay, so, so here's the thing. Bitcoin is a network, okay? So money is a network which comprises a central bank. Uh, it comprises Ronald Nyandandep, long time. So a bank or the fiat currency uh, is a network which comprises the central bank, comprises the commercial banks, and maybe um, the, all the other types of banks, financial institutions, uh, and also the people who are using the banking system. So the consumers, the, the bankers, the depositors, so to speak. So that is the network which comprises uh, the fiat uh, currency. Okay, but Bitcoin is just made up of a network of people like you and me, okay, uh, who each have, so each person becomes their own bank, okay? Each person becomes their own bank. And they can either buy the cryptocurrency and keep it in their bank, in, in their... So there's not actually an account, but uh, 
this cryptocurrency is res residing on a network and individual people have keys okay to their share of the network so if a network is is made of a hundred units and there are 10 people and each person has 10 units it means each person has keys uh, to those 10 units and they can use their key uh, to transfer two or three units to another uh, network participant so that's what bitcoin is all about it's about a network in which uh, there's a pool of money or there's a pool of value or a pool of currency and that pool is owned by individuals according uh, and, and they have keys which are evidence of what they own on the network so my key could be holding 20 units out of the 100 and your key might be holding 2 units or, or 30 units and so that's what it's all about so it's a network basically it's a network and in that net so so because we belong to the same network we have a single uh, database uh, which has got all the transactions so whatever transactions transaction takes place we have access to this uh, database but we cannot make changes okay um, to that database without consultation with the other members of this network. So there is validation which needs to take place. Right. And then, so the network is Bitcoin and the network of Bitcoin the technology, which is capital letter B. But it's also come up with an incentive system. So the incentive system is to incentivize those people who are helping to secure the network because the network it needs to be secure if you have a network it needs to be secure and because it's decentralized uh, even more reason for it to be secure David Murira uh, so so the Bitcoin the small letter B the cryptocurrency is just the um, that is the incentive system uh, for Bitcoin, the, the network of Bitcoin, the platform. Okay. I'm not going to talk about previous issues. I'll just read through part of the conclusion, that the part which makes sense, which I can then explain. So we've proposed a system. This is Satoshi Nakamoto and Tim. We don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto is. As much as you don't know, uh who created money who created paper money who created uh fiat currencies we don't know okay if you take out money from your pocket you will probably see the head of somebody i'll take one out here so this is 10 pounds and on this 10 pounds there is a head of the queen okay i don't know why her head is there okay but maybe it's to do with trust because uh, she's probably a trusted person, which which is why she doesn't make political statements, because that then that will tend to. Uh, if she made political statements and some people didn't like her, imagine if people didn't like her and she's on it on money. Okay, what would that do to a country? So I think that is one reason why. I just want to see if there is anything here, uh, which is quite common, like in God I. I says I can't read now properly. But on most money to write, I I I promise to pay the bearer on demand. And by the way, this is debt. This is um this means that I owe somebody something. That's why I've got this. Okay, that's why you go to work. You go to work so that you get paid. You get paid so that you pay some somebody. Okay. Um I was speaking to a friend earlier and we we're talking about mortgage and I was saying um, because you have a mortgage, it means that it's going to take you a very long time to finish a debt. So already you are in debt. If you're a student and you're being educated by a government uh, and you've been given a student loan, as soon as you start working, they want their money back. So already you are in debt as a student, you're already in debt. 
as soon as you finish you get more debt because you have to they have you have to get a mortgage okay and and then you and then you have to ask your uh, the question um exactly why the uh, the the price of a house appreciates okay because if i look at my house okay um although it's pr it's its price is going up i cannot explain why it's going up and i want you to help me with this maybe explain to me why it's going up because the walls are getting dirty uh the gutters need fixing uh there's a lot going wrong with the house okay it's getting old but its price is going up why is it going up because it means that the next person to buy this house has got more debt okay if i bought this house for say um i'm not gonna give uh, i'm gonna give an an arbitrary figure like five hundred thousand okay if i got this house for five hundred thousand and then within 10 15 20 years it's worth 1.5 million okay it means it's got uh, a million pounds on top it means the person who's going to buy this house is in more debt okay say for the inflation i know there's inflation and all that but that person is going to be in more debt so these are some of the things that we don't really think about on a daily basis but these are questions uh which the people that came up with bitcoin they ask these questions and to find answer to these questions they've come up with a currency uh which is different from what we are used to okay so we've proposed a system of ele for electronic transactions without relying on trust okay so the thing is if you have something that you're selling and i need to pay you 10 pounds okay um if i told you i didn't have the money on me and i was going to give you the money uh the following day if you trusted me you'd give me the thing sometimes even if you didn't trust me you'll still give me the thing and then you'd make a decision on whether to trust me again if i don't pay you tomorrow okay so trust is at the top of most of the transactions that we're making on a daily basis and so because we have a problem with trust we've come up with institutions which guarantee that trust and one of the institutions is the government if there's a government seal on anything you're most likely to trust it than if there's no government seal on it and also banks are more trusted than individuals so you'd rather some people would rather meet in a bank okay in order to make a transaction because it's an institution of trust just like churches and other public institutions those are institutions of trust okay but bitcoin is different bitcoin is a network okay which does not rely on trust in fact it works better where there's no trust okay that's what bitcoin is designed to do it's designed to perform in a place where there's no trust and more so now because now we have um we are making a lot of transactions online okay on the internet but the internet itself is not a trusted place so bitcoin has come up in order to address that issue where you can now transact without having to worry about trust in fact you can now tra transact uh without even thinking about trust because it's a it's it's Bitcoin itself is also called the trust protocol, okay? We started with the usual framework of coins made from digital signatures, which provides strong control of ownership, but is incomplete without a way to prevent double spending. I've talked about that. To solve this, we proposed a peer-to-peer -peer network. Peer-to-peer -peer network using proof of work to record a public history of transactions that quickly becomes computationally impractical for an attacker to, to change if honest nodes control a majority of CPU power. Okay, so it is more difficult to hack um, a Bitcoin network, which is why in almost 10 years, every hacking attempt has
has failed. Okay, let's say so far, because you never know. Uh, it could be hacked one day, but the way it works is that it becomes increasingly more difficult and expensive as well, because imagine that to mine one Bitcoin probably consumes as much electricity as a household pays at the end of the month. So that's just one Bitcoin. To reverse or to hack or to reverse that transaction will take even more electricity. So that whoever is trying to do it would have to pay a lot of money. So there is no incentive to hack. There is incentive to secure the network. There's incentive to make it more secure, but there's a disincentive to attack it or to undo what has already been done. Okay. So basically that's what Bitcoin is all about. It's not just about money. It's about uh, applications, just like the internet is not just about Facebook. The internet is not just about email. The internet is not just about um, Skype, for example. The internet is about all of these applications. Okay, so you have the internet, then you've got the applications which are running on the internet. In as much as you have Bitcoin, the network, then you have applications like Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency with a small letter B, Bitcoin, the network as capital letter B, Bitcoin, the uh, cryptocurrency as a small letter B. And it's not the only application. So Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency is just one application. Then you have other applications, including social media applications. You have what we call, um, you have platforms like D2, for example, on, on the decentralized, on the, on the blockchain, on the Bitcoin. You have applications which mimic Facebook, which mimic YouTube, which mimic uh, all the... You can think of any platform, any platform, any application that you find on the internet. And that application is going to have a counterpart or it, ca it can convert and become... Um, for example, Facebook could change its business model. Although because Facebook has already got investors... Uh, it's unlikely to do that. So it's unlikely to come up or to buy one of these platforms which are already decentralized and maybe have another business model. Just like they've bought WhatsApp, just like Facebook has bought um, Instagram. You know, they could buy, they could buy Steemit, for example, they could buy Apex. So Apex is one such platform, which is like Facebook. Steemit is another platform, which is just like um uh wordpress okay but the difference is that the platforms on bitcoin are decentralized the platforms uh on the internet most of them or almost all of them are centralized just like traditional institutions are also centralized okay guys i know this is um this is um it's a difficult topic not only to explain, but to understand. And so what all I ask is that you guys ask questions because it's not the difficult stuff that needs explaining. It's the simple stuff that needs explaining. So if you can ask me any question on this, then I can answer it and I can be more specific because right now I'm trying to be as general as possible and also... Um, I'm trying to relate to what we already know, which is also a problem with Bitcoin, because it's almost like after learning um, mechanical or after learning um, mechanical physics, for example, you then go on to learn quantum mechanics, okay? If you go on to learn quantum mechanics, it sort of flips everything upside down. Okay, so Bitcoin sort of flips everything upside down. And it is difficult to compare it to what we already know. Because that, that, in, that produces problems in our understanding of Bitcoin. Because it's a completely revolutionary technology. But it's trying to address the problems that we have now. And the other problem is that in some places, for example... There is no need for Bitcoin yet because they have no problems 
uh, with liquidity, for example. So they don't see the need for, for Bitcoin. But in other places where uh, governments have failed to provide liquidity um, and where the technology is or the infrastructure is, is right uh, for Bitcoin to be implemented, okay? Um, in those places, they might see more need for Bitcoin than in others. It's just like there is need for uh, public transport in other places than in other places, okay? So it's, so, um, it's difficult to prescribe the same solution uh, for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is more of a solution in some places than in others. So it's going to, and also Bitcoin is a technology which is disrupting governments. And so governments are naturally resistant to the idea of Bitcoin, which is making the adoption of Bitcoin. Somebody asked me uh, if Bitcoin is such a solution, if Bitcoin is so good, then why is Bitcoin uh, not being adopted uh, like fast? But it's because the institution that is trying to replace, okay, rely, their power relies on those institutions. So if you try to replace those institutions with Bitcoin, you're just, one, you're killing governments, you're killing banks, you're even schools, you're killing schools, okay? You're killing hospitals, okay? You're killing healthcare systems, educational systems, governance. You're even disrupting uh, voting, which means some people will not be able to to rig anymore. So I talked about all the applications that it can use, and those include uh, almost all the applications which are running on the internet. So it could replace them, but it can also replace government. It can also replace, um, uh, we talk about land barons in Zimbabwe, for example. And the reason land barons are able to flourish is because there is no system of checks and balances which is able to track exactly what they are doing. So they are able to do this. But if we could do that, and with Bitcoin, we can do that. We can track the land registry. England, Britain is already doing that. It's already doing the uh, using the blockchain uh, to... To um, I'm just checking. Christian, welcome. Elliot, welcome. Dr. Wiseman, Dr. Elliot. Uh, welcome, guys. Welcome, my sister Trish from Northern, from Ireland. Uh, Marita Ndepi, I was with you just now. So, guys, I've come to the end of this one. Uh, not an interesting topic for most people, but for me, it's revolutionary. It's like, it's like talking about the internet in 1989 or 1990, you know. When you talked about the internet then, it was, it was difficult to explain um, HTTP, um, internet, uh, hypertext, internet uh, trans transfer protocol and all that. It was difficult to do that. It was difficult to explain email. What is email? It was difficult to explain anything to do with the internet. So in 2018, it is difficult to talk about Bitcoin and to explain it. We can compare it to the internet, but it still doesn't make sense to a lot of people. But I think it's a revolutionary technology. And I think it's a solution to some of the problems that we confront, especially in Africa, anything to do with trust. So think of Bitcoin as a solution to anything that has to do uh, with recording something. So any, any information that is recorded, if we can record information and make sure that that information cannot be changed by anyone and can be, for example, voting. Imagine if we could stop uh, people rigging voting, okay, political parties from rigging. We could stop them with Bitcoin, okay? And how could we do that? Because it's a it would timestamp everything. It will check who voted when, um, and then we could refer to to the database, the the blockchain, the decentralized database, which will be available on everyone's computer who's taken part in the voting, and it will be difficult for anyone to change the result because any change would be the computer which tried to change a voting, okay, could be identified 
and the person could be identified. And before a change could take place, um, the other computers would have to agree to the change. And that will be difficult to achieve. So thanks guys for watching. Um, I think I've answered the two questions which I was asked. So I will see you in another video. I'm going to make as many as possible um, different topics. But uh, this Bitcoin, I think, is something I'm going to be talking about for the next 10 to 20 years until we all get it. Good night.